One of the staples of uh, television programs at this time of year, aside from you know, the Christmas musical specials and the winter holidays and all that kind of stuff, are programs that show the various ways that different cultural groups uh, celebrate uh, Christmas. The point uh, being made that there are many Christmas traditions uh, that are being uh, pursued that include uh, people who don't even believe in Christmas, but uh, they celebrate it anyways. I tell you the story once long ago about in Japan, in Tokyo, uh, in a department store, uh, they had uh, you know, a setup for Christmas. And, in their, and this was a long time ago. I think they're a little more enlightened now, but uh, in the window they had Santa Claus uh, crucified on a cross. Uh, not, they weren't quite sure of the idea. Uh, by that part, unfortunately. Um, the truth, however, is that in our uh, own uh, modern society, uh, we have uh, two, two Christmases, the uh, two types of Christmas. The first type is what I call the Santa Claus uh, Christmas. This is uh, the Christmas of uh, colored lights, Christmas trees, family dinners, the exchange of gifts. There's nothing wrong with this uh, Christmas as many cultures have adopted it and uh, celebrate it uh, just as we do here in America. Santa Claus Christmas, absolutely. Santa's Christmas, however, has become less and less about Jesus as the years go by and more about a, a public holiday that everyone can share regardless of their religious or religious uh, religion or religious uh, background. Uh, a, a sign of this uh, secularization of Christmas has been the push to replace, you know, the Merry Christmas greeting uh, with the more secular Happy Holidays greeting because it has no religious connotation and thus uh, doesn't risk offending anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus or in any other God for that matter. So they can say, well, happy holidays, you know, and they're in the spirit of the season, and, uh, but they make no religious reference uh, to anything. And so the Santa Claus Christmas or holiday is slowly, slowly moving towards maintaining the tradition uh, because it is an incredibly profitable one for most retailers but stripping away its religious elements little by little each year, because in many ways they conflict with the excess and the commercialization of Santa's Christmas. Let's face it, I mean, we spend a lot of money on Santa's Christmas. Uh, we eat a lot on Santa's Christmas. And more and more, uh, the, this holiday you know, is slowly drifting away from what it actually uh, was meant to be uh, long ago. So that's, that's the Santa's Christmas. Then we have this other Christmas, uh, and that's signifying the birth of Jesus. The believer's Christmas, I call it. This is the idea, uh, and in whose spirit we as Christians mark this time of year, or remember at least at this time of year. Even if we know from history and from the Bible uh, that the birth of Jesus probably took place in the springtime, uh, and that unlike baptism or church attendance or communion, uh, there is no command or example or instruction in the Bible given to us by God to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we have to have a special holiday for, for Jesus' birth. You know? We have a special thing to commemorate his death, but there's nothing that tells us we have to commemorate his, uh, his birth, not in the Bible anyways. However, most Christians are, are happy with the idea that at least once per year, it seems that the entire world is focused on the birth of Jesus Christ, that particular event. And most Christians join in the uh, honor and recognition of our Lord and Savior. However, for the believer, for the disciple, for those who consider Jesus as Lord, the birth of Jesus Christ signifies three important realities that are not part of Santa's Christmas and rarely spoken of during the Christmas rush. For this reason, I'd like to share these with you 
before the season comes uh, to a close and thoughts of Jesus are unfortunately packed away along with the Christmas lights. And it is, uh, uh, it is uh, proper, I guess, that it, uh, this uh, lesson be the last one of the year to close uh, out the year and to close out the, uh, the Christmas season, so to speak. So let's talk about the three realities of Christmas uh, or as uh, Christians see it, uh, Jesus' birth. The first reality of a Christmas. God becomes man. This is not news to Christians. Everyone seems to be familiar with this idea that God took on a human flesh and lived on earth as a man, a Jewish man called Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. And we'll talk about some of the amazing things he did in a moment, but here's the point that I wanna make first. Did you know that Christianity is the only religion in history and in the world where God becomes a man? Only religion where God becomes a man. In other words, God, the supreme being, the creator of the universe and mankind becomes fully human and interacts with people at their level even experiences human emotions like joy and sadness and anger, love, hunger and pain, even physical death. I'll read just one of many scriptures that refer to this amazing phenomenon. In uh, John 1, uh, verse 1 and then down in verse 14, John writes, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then if you go down to verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So we need to understand, realize that no other religion teaches this. No other religion teaches this I this idea, this truth, this fact, this history. No other religion teaches that humans become godlike or that uh, humans are reincarnated. I mean, a lot of religions teach a lot of things about God and man, that's what I'm saying here. Perhaps humans are reincarnated, that humans are eventually absorbed by a force that is like God, or that humans are recycled back into the earth, or that there are two gods or many gods, or that if you are good enough, God will take you into heaven, or that God or the gods uh, have human appetites like food and sex, or, or that there's, there, there is no God. I mean, there's all kinds of beliefs about God, but that God intentionally becomes a man. This is the greatest single gift of enlightenment ever given to mankind, bar none. In every other form of religion that has or exists now, man or mankind works his way up to divinity in one way or another. Only in Christianity does God reach down and brings mankind up to himself by becoming a human savior. Only in Christianity. That God becomes man makes Christianity theologically unique and superior to all other religions. No human being could have invented such a concept. When humans invent religions, you get all kinds of things, but you never get God becoming a man. That's the first reality of Christmas, if you wish. The second reality, it is the true turning point or dividing line in history. In other words, the birth of Jesus is the hinge of history. The obvious sign of this in a secular way is that the standard of measured time held by the majority of the world, even in countries that don't believe in God, 
is still BC before Christ and AD in Latin, which means Anno Domini or in the year of the Lord. These terms are used to measure years in the Julian and the Gregorian uh, calendars. Uh, there has been an effort in the past to change these terms to BCE, meaning before common era, and CE, common era. Uh, this change has been motivated by atheists and, and, and secularists, but before Christ, BC, and AD in the year of our Lord, continues to be used to divide history uh, since these calendars were created uh, more than 1500 years ago. The use of BC and AD doesn't prove anything. However, it does demonstrate the incredible and lasting impact that the birth of Jesus has had on the world. There have been great uh, uh, important wars, great kings, spectacular inventions, religious leaders with millions of followers, but there is only uh, the time before Christ's birth and the time after Christ's birth as far as human history is concerned. Another historical marker defined uh, by Jesus is that the actual changes that have occurred as a direct result of his life and his teachings. We see these as we examine the effects of Christianity, the faith that Jesus established during his short life uh, here, on, uh, here on earth. For example, loving your enemies. In Matthew 5, 43 and 4, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Watching the, you know, the death spiral that is taking place now in the Middle East, as two cultures who believe and practice an eye for an eye, uh, that kind of justice should be enough to show us the superiority of Jesus' teaching on the human interaction and the possibility of human healing that comes from forgiving your enemies. If both of the nations that are at war in the Middle East at the moment practice loving your enemy and forgiving your enemy, this war would be over. But there is no end to it. It'll continue and it'll go on and on and on. You and I will be dead and gone and our children will have grandchildren and this war will just keep on going. Because the protagonists each believe an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. They don't believe in forgiving enemies. And for that reason, the war uh, will continue. Forgiving and blessing your enemy has never caused a conflict to grow worse, whether it be between two people or two nations. And no one has come up with a better solution because it requires one of the parties to rely more perfectly on God. And so that's one of the changes that has taken place because of Jesus' teaching. Another one, Marriage, in other words, the sanctity of marriage and the equality of women and the sacredness of life itself, these were not concepts introduced by Jesus, but they were affirmed and promoted in his teachings as well as the teachings of the apostles in the early church and of course the church uh, throughout history up until this day. At the time when Jesus was on earth, women had no rights, never mind equal rights, they had no rights whatsoever within marriage. And slavery was a common element in every culture. And unwanted babies, mostly girls, were left in open fields to die of exposure or the attack of wild animals. That was the common practice. It's not written much. We don't read about it in the Bible or anything like that. But one of the um, markers, if you wish, one of the things that early Christians were known for was that they would rescue these babies that had been left in open fields to die because people didn't want uh, you know, an extra baby, uh, whatever, whatever the reason. Uh, they would rescue these children. There were no orphanages. There was no such thing as that. 
This was one of the things about these Christians in the first century that people marveled at because just leaving children to die was fine. Nobody had anything you know, worried about it. It was Christ's teaching and the early Christian church's influence in society that elevated marriage back to the biblical ideal of one man and one woman united together in marriage for life with God's blessing. This made marriage the highest expression of love and commitment that two people could offer to one another and to God. Christianity's teachings, not Islam or other Eastern religions, it was Christianity's teachings on the value of each life made in God's image. This is what led to the abolishment of slavery and, and infanticide in the countries that became Christianized in that early and middle age period. Christianity didn't abolish slavery by marching in the street or setting fires to buildings. No, it was, it was the salt and the light method. The salt of Christian teaching and Christian love and the light of the better ideas and ideals of Christianity. This is what eclipsed uh, these uh, social ills uh, a year at a time and a decade at a time until they were no longer uh, acceptable uh, in popular uh, culture. Whenever these social evils returned, slavery and abortion, for example, note that it was and still is the community of believers in Christ who oppose these things. Most who promote tra traditional marriage and, and who are pro-life as well as pro-freedom for every individual regardless of culture, usually these same people are pro-Christ. No other religious or philosophical or political or military leader has had as good and lasting an impact on the world for good as Jesus Christ. The third reality of Christ's birth, it was the end of Satan's domination. It marked the beginning of the end of Satan's domination over mankind. Before Christ, the spiritual tools to defend against Satan were not uh, widely or fully available. The Jews were unique because they had some basic resources like proof that God existed uh, through the miracles uh, that they had seen. And, and they had information on what God wanted. They had the law and the ordinances. They also had uh, promises of better things to come. Uh, the promise of the Messiah, for example, uh, who would forgive them for their sins and who would elevate them in their spiritual lives. Outside of Judaism, however, there was total darkness. There was no defense against Satan's power. Think about that. No defense against Satan's power because these cultures were in complete darkness. Uh, that's why in the little bit we read in the Bible about other cultures, especially in the Old Testament, we read about sexual perversions and cruelty, constant war, uh, idolatry, people cutting themselves or burning their babies as sacrifices to pagan idols. Uh, we read about slavery and cheating and corruption, uh, uh, possession and torture by evil spirits, uh, the magic and the occult, uh, religious prostitution. What do you think they're talking about? You know, temple prostitutes. Who do you think they were? They were men and they were women who, uh, you know, who were available for, for sexual activity as part of the religious uh, practice of that time. Satan had great power over the people who were in the darkness. However, with the birth and the subsequent ministry of Christ, along with his death on the cross to pay the moral debt that uh, every person had had because of their sins, you know, disobedience of God's will and his commands. Because of these things, Satan's ability to lure human beings into sin was greatly diminished. 
For example, Satan's power uh, is uh, to be able uh, to pronounce lies. Uh, in John chapter eight, verse 44, we read Jesus himself saying, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so Jesus taught the truth about normal life and about spiritual life so that Satan's lies were neutralized. Satan's power also was in his ability to lure people into disobeying God's laws and thus sinning and thus subjecting them to the punishment for sin. As Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, for the wage of sin, this is what Satan was able to do, lure people into sin, but then the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus made restitution to God for all of our sins. Isaiah 53, five says, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him and by his scourging, uh, we are healed. Yes, we still sin because Satan is still at work, right? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we still sin because Satan is still at work, but now there is forgiveness for all past sins. Familiar passage in Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent be each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. All the past sins he talks about there, as well as forgiving forgiveness for the sins that we still fall into as Christians today. One other passage here is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess to God our sins and he forgives us. We don't confess to another person. So the point here, lots of scriptures, but what's the point? The point is Satan still has the power to tempt us and to lure us, but the cross of Jesus neutralizes him by providing everyone forgiveness for the sins that we fall into. Imagine a world where you were aware of the fact that you had done something wrong and your conscience was weighing on you, but there was no way to get away from that. There was no, there was no method to, to uh, unburden yourself uh, from these sins. And it was like that for your, for your whole life. Another thing, Satan's spiritual power was broken. Uh, angels, even fallen angels, are more powerful uh, than people. However, God enables us to stand firm and overcome the evil one by giving us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us at uh, baptism. Amazing how this passage here is, uh, teaches us so much. When Peter says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name for, uh, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so God guarantees us that the Holy Spirit within us is greater than any power in the world, including Satan's power. Uh, once again, uh, in John, 1 John 4, 4, you are from God, he says, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so uh, let me finish the lessons with the all important, uh, so what here? Sure, uh, these may be interesting ideas, but what do they have to do with me? In other words, thanks for the sermon, but so what? Uh, well, if the things that I've taught and demonstrated to you tonight from God's word are accurate from the scriptures, and the scriptures are true and from God, then here's what these things, what, what they mean for all of us. First of all, I go back to this, Jesus, is God. It was this realization that began my search. You know, people say, when did it, what was the turning point you know, in all of our lives? What was the turning point when you began searching for God? And for me, it was this, kind of almost silly when you think about it, all of us here, I believe are, are believers, are Christians. It was the thought, one moment, this flash of insight, 
where I said to myself, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is God. Wait a minute. Wait. Jesus is God. Oh, that's what that means. Imagine that. All that Catholic education for almost 30 years got me to the point. Oh, that's what they mean. He's God. Who is God? Well, it's him. Who's the him? It's Jesus. I mean, actually, that was actually, you know, the, the, the genius <laughs> thinking the thing through here for a moment. But what I'm saying is that the understanding that Jesus is God, this is the thing that sets you about on the right path, searching for the right thing, looking for the right, uh, the right answers. Jesus is God, not Allah, he's not God, not Buddha, he's not God, not Krishna, he's not God, not any other so-called deity or power or force. Only Jesus is God, the rest, are a waste of time and effort. Uh, I know that's a harsh thing to say, uh, maybe not so much here, but our friends who listen online may be sympathetic to these other uh, ancient religions, uh, religions followed by millions of people uh, with many wise people among them who, who follow these things, sure. But Jesus is God, and if Jesus is God, all these others are not. It simplifies things, it clarifies things, it gives us a, a way to walk. Jesus, therefore, is your best faith option. If you're turning to God, then turn to Jesus, because the Bible says that's who he is. That's why it's important that he was born. God in the form of man came among us. Who, who is that? Buddha? No, Jesus, he's God. Another so what idea. The one who created the greatest change in the world can also create a great change in you. Only he can take you from lost to saved and from being temporal to being eternal. No other God promises this. No other religion articulates this idea and articulates it clearly. No other, no other thinking or philosophy even dares to suggest that it has the power to, to, to transform you from being something temporal to being something eternal and consciously so. Only he can take you from one stat status to the other. I mean, the whole point of his resurrection uh, was to prove that such a thing was possible. If the spirit did it for him, he can and he will do it for us. As the apostle says in uh, Romans chapter eight, verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I mean, you can take that to the bank. Why do you know that you will live forever and that you will consciously live forever? Well, Romans 8, 11. Well, how's he going to do that? Well, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, and we have historical proof that that happened, that same spirit given to us at baptism uh, will eventually raise us from the dead. That's how it happens. Now, I can't explain to you, you know, in, uh, metaphysically how exactly a spirit dwells inside of a human physical body. I don't know. He doesn't give us that information. He doesn't tell us you know, the dynamics of it or the, the biology of it, I, I don't know. He just tells us, this is how I'm going to do it. The spirit that rose uh, Jesus uh, from the dead, that same spirit that you received when you confess his name and go into the waters of baptism, that same spirit is gonna raise you from the dead. That's how it's gonna happen. No further explanations given None needed. And then finally, if, if what the scripture says is true, the third so what, 
Uh, then Jesus breaks Satan's power over you personally. Romans 8, 1, my favorite scripture, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I, when I get into my uh, uh, pity party or when I get into a I'm not good enough party or if I go to the, the, uh, you know, the, the hootenanny where the subject of the hootenanny is going to be, uh, Mike's not good enough to get to where he wants to go. Uh, I remember Romans 8, 1. God himself is telling me, who is going to condemn you? If I don't condemn you, who cares? Why should you care if you condemn yourself or, or your brother-in-law condemns you or your dad condemns you or you know, who, if I don't condemn you, <laughs> that neutralizes everybody else, even yourself. The spiritual reality that few people recognize is that if you're not consciously free and serving Jesus, you are therefore unconsciously bound by your unforgiven sins and serving Satan without realizing it. These are the only options. Nobody is on the fence. Just remember one thing, when it comes to God, you're all in or you're all out. There are no fence sitters. If you're here tonight and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm just waiting to see if I, I hear a good enough argu argument for, you know, to get, well, you're not actually sitting in the fence. You're on your way to condemnation. Because you're all in or you're all out. So there no, there's no in-between spot. God hasn't given us an in-between spot. And so on this New Year's Eve, of course, I, I hope that everyone has a happy Santa holiday. That's good with family, good food, the exchange of gifts to show our love and appreciation for one another. I mean, our family enjoyed it. I hope your family did too. This is the best of Christmas. And I pray that you are blessed with the merriest of times because this holiday only comes around once a year. However, for those who believe in the birth of Jesus, the son of the living God, I encourage you to be thankful for the gifts that he has brought to all who believe in him and have become his disciples. Gifts that we experience not just at Christmas, uh, but at every day of the year. Of course, the birth of Jesus and all that it gives us, that's a gift. Forgiveness for all of our sins, that's a gift. Peace of mind because there's no longer any condemnation for me, that's a gift. Power over Satan because the one who is in me is stronger than the one who is in the world, that's a gift. And eternal life, that's a gift just to name a few. So if you've not yet consciously decided to become his disciple, by repenting of your sins and uh, being immersed or baptized as an expression of your faith in him, I encourage you to do that without delay, since no one knows when the, the judgment will come. And when it does come, it'll be too late to confess the Lord then. Decide now, decide right now, this evening, if you're all in, or all out, decide. Wouldn't it be great to know that you went from all, in, all out to all in just at the last day of uh, this year and could begin uh, 2024 as being all in for the Lord. We'll stand and sing a song, last song of invitation for the year. If you need to come and either confess Christ and be baptized or you, baptized, or you need to come forward and ask Ask for help to be all in. I want to be an all in Christian. And you're not quite sure how, that, how that's going to happen. If you need prayers for that, then we'll, we'll do that. Our elders are here, ministers are here to pray for you. And we're all here to pray for each other. Shall we now stand and sing that song of invitation?